Hello, innovators. I'm Todd Wyant, and welcome to the Bridging the Gap podcast sponsored by Applied Software. You're invited to join our MEP and construction innovation adventure with the mission to propel this great industry forward. My guest today is Troy DeGroote with over 20 years as a detailer, designer, and BIM manager prior to teaching. Troy has cultivated a deep understanding of the requirements of customers, the needs of the end users, and goals common goals of management and the capabilities of Bluebeam technology. He's also the mastermind behind the amazing blog, bluebeamandburgers.com. Welcome to the show, Troy. Thanks, Todd. How are you doing? Pretty good. How about you? Good. Well, let's start with how you got into the construction industry. Sure. I started um, through an internship in high school, actually. I had taken all nice. the drafting courses available, and um, the next option was to work half days on my senior year. So started out uh, steel detailing, drawing board drafting, um, okay. drawing drawing and counting all those nuts and bolts and making sure the holes line up. Yeah, nice. What about that grip you to want to make a career out of it? Oh, it was, it was fun. It was like an old erector set. You just, um, you know, you're drawing these huge buildings, but you're you're interested in the 16th of an inch on everything. So yeah, you watch all that go together and, and that kind of moved into engineering and um, doing design drawings for structure. Did that for many, many years. And um, like you said, in the intro worked into a BIM manager role and, um, and then moved into teaching after 20 years of being in a cubicle, I decided I wanted to get in front of people and teach. So yeah, loving it. Nice. Uh, so as you're going into companies now, during kind of the, the discovery phase, what are some things that you are looking for and you're assessing, uh, you know, to see if whether it's Bluebeam or, or some other software is, is applicable for their needs? Right. So I think the most important thing to learn from them is, and that's what I'm there to do is learn, uh, what are their current workflows? Are they all consistently doing those workflows? Um, if not, you know, are there best practices that we want to uh, push to everyone through mm -hmm. this implementation? Uh, and then beyond those, are there agreed upon goals top to bottom? You know, we want to make sure that we're really setting the foundation of the software and the tools that we're going to create in the training before we just go in and, and do it. Uh, mm -hmm. we'll, what we find a lot with Bluebeam Review is that people are self-taught and they go in and they learn, you know, a little bit of what they need. Uh, and then what we hear at every company we go into is we probably use 5% of the software. So, sure. <laughs> so we can, we can fix that. Yeah. When you talk about the, uh, you know, figuring out the consistency of workflows across the organization and kind of coming up with those goals, do you see communication as a uh, uh, stumbling block to that. And what I mean by that is that, you know, some, some groups may have one thing in mind, but it, another group has another thing in mind. And those two groups probably right. haven't communicated exactly what they are, are thinking and meaning and trying to accomplish. Right. What you see is a lot of places, um, teams or even individuals have a best practice and, you know, they all get to the end goal, but, um, they might get there differently. So what I try to do, um, what I try to do is really interview the more senior people that wow. are maybe resistant to change and build their wisdom into the tools. Hmm. Um, so then, you know, if they're resistant to change, they start to have ownership in those tools and training um, as a legacy when they hand, when we do that. So, and it makes onboarding easier. It makes, um, you know, you're training somebody who starts next week, they can make markups that, are the same as the guy that's been there 20 years. So, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you do see a lot of variation in how things are done and uh, the best approach to things. And, and I try to kind of wrangle those into a single best practice based on the goals. And, um, and usually once you get everybody in a room and they realize that they're doing it different, they can all kind of adjust and, and come to an agreement. So, yeah. Uh, have you found any kind of, foundational building blocks that people have to have in order to have a successful technology adoption and implementation? I think just an open mind and, and being creative. 
um, you know, what are your goals, what's possible, and, and don't hold yourself back to how we've always done it. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times with software these days is you can accomplish way more than you even maybe want to for, you know, as a byproduct of what you usually do. So uh, kind of embracing those things that happen automatically are, are key. A lot of companies that I'll go into, um, I'll learn from them. You know, they, they might just want to learn about markups and, but I'll go into the sales process and the install process and try to link all of that together in a, in a consistent workflow instead of being siloed into, you know, everybody starts the drawings over again when they get to their part. Yeah. So that's kind of an eye opener to a lot of companies is, you know, they can have these, these drawings and markups live from sales all the way through facility management. If, if that's the case. Yeah. Uh, so you were talking there about kind of keeping that open mind and um, the, the growth mindset, getting out of the, this is the way we've always done it, which is right. a very frustrating phrase for <laughs> a, a whole bunch of people. Uh, how do you get the, the buy-in from, people that may at first be resistant? I think it's listening to them, um, making sure that, yeah, this is the way we've always done it. And for good reason, we mm -hmm. need to acknowledge that, that um, there's a good reason we've always done it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but then build those into tools that we can do digitally or do faster or just do consistently across, you know, different individuals. You know, when, when I do, when I create tools for estimating, you'll go to a different estimator, you know, three different estimators within the same company and they're putting in different waste factors and um, things like that. And you know, if you can build that in consistently, then you can all work together when it's crunch time and get the same results. Yeah. Embracing that true collaboration. Right. Mindset, not just a buzzword. Right, right. The tools are there, so. Nice. Uh, well, how do you, you mentioned, uh, you know, that kind of gaining the wisdom from those battle-tested industry vets. Uh, how do you recommend kind of bringing that wisdom into the tools? What does that look like? Typically, I'll ask those guys, um, you know, what are your workflows? How are you doing it currently? Uh, with Bluebeam in particular, you know, you have a yellow highlighter. What does that mean on your drawings? What does the green one mean? Uh -huh. is typically I'll create those highlighters again in Bluebeam with the same meaning and I'll replace your highlighters. I'll replace your calculator, things like that. So uh, that, and just, you know, are there markups that you're placing all the time? When I work with cities doing plan review, they'll, they'll place paragraphs with, uh, you know, code sections and, and verbiage that they just place over and over again. We can build those into tools so you never have to type them again. And yeah. really, no matter who the the um, reviewer is, they're placing the same markup. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, though, why should why should people really care and kind of take the time for that proper knowledge transfer? I think it's the legacy workflows are proven to to work. Uh, they got they they propelled the company to where they are now and the successful business that they've been. And we can't forget that, but there's an opportunity with technology to um, carry that forward in a quicker and consistent manner. I'm sure you hear some, uh, if you're transferring the, the knowledge from the person into the, the tools and the, the software, does it then, does the computer replace that, that person or is it an efficiency player? Um, you know, how do, how do you alleviate that concern of, I'm not going to give up my, my right. intellectual uh, knowledge and, and give it to the software because I'm going to be out of a job. Right, right. I, that, I understand that. That's a concern. Um, I think that, I think that's a valid, valid concern. I've been there, but um, you're also potentially giving up your, or taking back your weekends. <laughs> and, your, and your late nights is kind of what I think. Yeah. Is, you know, they'll always find more work than you can do. So if you can do it faster and more efficiently and really, you know, avoid, 
mistakes is another big one. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think it really opens up the possibility and potential to do more variety of things as well too. Like you're, because you're, you're getting maybe a little bit more bandwidth back into your day, you're going to be able to take it to a, a level that you haven't been able to before. Cause you've been doing these, you know, not mundane, but more repetitive tasks that now the computer can come along and it's about enhancing and augmenting right. it, not about just totally taking it over. Right. For sure. I know when, uh, when I went from AutoCAD to Revit, it was exactly that, you know, you, you got to, you created everything more or less in a plan view with, with a Z plane, but then you got all these section cuts and elevations for free. And, and to yeah. me, that was exciting. Right. You know, one of the things that I picked up very quickly with steel detailing was the visualization. And when you're drawing things in, things in 2D, you know, I could still see it in 3D. So when Revit came along, it was like I was constantly clicking to that 3D view and, oh, yeah, that's exactly what it looks like. <laughs> yeah, that makes it come to life more. Yeah, yeah. When I build tools and templates and things, I really try to make them so that the user will trip into doing them correctly mm. and they have to go out of their way to go away from the standards. So mm. um, I think that helps in the implementation as well. Yeah. So from the company's perspective, with everybody using the the same tool and you've kind of uh, communicated out that, that workflow of what it should be and, and what it looks like and you create that standard, uh, what's the impact for the company with that? Oh, well, I've had companies... Um, come back and say that I've cut projects that would normally take two to three weeks. They're doing in two to three days. Wow. You know, that particular case was a P and ID customer who was going uh -huh. out and just collecting a ton of information in the field and uh, a lot more accurate, a lot more. Um, <laughs> he just saved a lot of time because he wasn't taking handwritten notes and, and then transferring them and making mistakes and, and all that stuff. Yeah, that's huge especially yeah. for an industry that is looking to save time at every single corner. Right. Yeah. They're shaving time and, and everything off, off their workflows. And um, I think it's a big deal that, that you can place the comments and things like that and just be consistent between people within the same company. I think yeah. that's, that helps people understand, you know, how long are things going to take? What's it going to cost? And, you know, when everybody's using the same tools. Sure. Uh, one of the comments that uh, you had mentioned to me before was uh, combining the, the best of the craftsmen with the best of the technology. And I, I, I love that comment. Why do you think that that's in, an important refrain to um, help people along in this process? I think it's a, uh it's a stepping stone for those people that are maybe new to the industry. They're, they're going to leap in their experience. They're going to leap forward so much faster when they embrace the, the tools and things that we can build with those legacy information in it. You know, how does that person look at the project or look at um, their specific discipline, things like that um, even beyond you know, if they retire, we can still be learning from those people mm -hmm. uh, as we hire people. So I think um, onboarding is a lot easier when you have the tools set up and you're not um, teaching the industry and workflows at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that helps as well. Nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer in, uh, you know, having the people that have the, the real world skills communicate and, and be on the same team and on the same page with the people that have those software skills, because both are valuable. You need both in an organization for sure. Uh, and a lot of times they can talk past each other. So how do you get them sitting down, working on the same team in the same environment? Uh, I think any way that you can foster that is, is a, a game changer. Right. I think there is somewhat of a disconnect with the designers and the field. Uh, what do things really look like? You know, I know when I started out detailing, uh, the engineer was always, 
the trouble. They designed things that didn't work. And yeah. And then you start to work for the engineer and maybe it's the architect and then it's the owner. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I think with uh, technology going the way it is now, um, the, those teams are a lot more connected than ever. And, and really understanding you know, the technology in the field is amazing these days and being able to see those models and, and navigate around and uh, scheduling where things are going to be at when and, mm -hmm. you know, project out those different times and, you know, when the different groups can show up and do their work. It's, it's amazing the technology yeah. that's coming into, into play these days. Oh, for sure. And, and more coming every day. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's an exciting time for, for contact. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so let's zero in a little bit more on, on Bluebeam. What, what are some things that get you excited about Bluebeam right now? Um, lots of things. I, I just enjoy building the tools and, you know, every company is different. So I love to go in and learn their workflows, uh, build those custom tools. You know, I've built tools that will calculate occupancy. You know, all they do is the area of a room, select what type of room it is, and it'll tell them, you know, all those calculations. Uh, some other ones I did recently were um, rebar estimates. So uh -huh. we're tracing out the concrete on the plan and it'll give us the volume of concrete and, and all the rebar inside. So um, that stuff excites me. It's kind of, you know, I kind of geek out on the, on the markups list down below and putting in formulas and all that stuff. Um, and it's always different. So it, it's, it's fun to walk into these different companies and take what you've learned and just grow on it at the next one and the next one. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Uh, any tips or uh, parts of Bluebeam that are kind of hidden gems that, that, that may be a game changer, but, but most people today, either they don't know about it or they aren't leveraging it. I, I think um, I'm surprised at how many people don't use or don't know about sets. Um, in Bluebeam, they have a what they call sets, where we can take individual sheets, pull them together into what they call a set. And um, what's nice about it is now we can slip sheet. So when there's a revision, we can slide in, just like we did on the paper documents, uh, that new sheet, staple it in. Um, and it'll stamp the old one superseded and move all the markups to the new one. Mm -hmm. and, and then you're always looking at the newest one on top and you can always rec reference back to the older versions of those drawings. Um, that's a big one. The, the document compare and overlay are great tools in, com in combination with that to be able to see what changed and where. Um, and then uh, with, with COVID and everything, the studio projects and sessions has been huge. Um, the number of sessions being created has just gone up exponentially in the last year and and the training for that is has been uh one of the main ones that we've gone after uh, just teaching that over and over again mm -hmm. because it's free it's part of every seat of bluebeam they can work in the cloud and go through and collaborate on all those markups with with everyone else at the same time yeah uh so hitting on my my next question uh how has Bluebeam really helped the the collaboration game, especially over the the last year, where that's uh, become a even bigger necessity? Right, right. So we talked about estimating uh, and crunch time. If you've got those tools that you know it's it's Friday afternoon, you got to get the estimate out. You can have multiple people jump in and work on the exact same sheet, maybe uh, measuring out different material here and there. Uh, where I've seen the biggest impact, though, is with cities. So I've done implementations at over 30 municipalities, and mm -hmm. construction has kind of kept going to some degree. And those drawings still need to be reviewed and approved for permits and things like that. So sure. when, this, when the plan reviewers aren't working at the city office anymore, um, We've done a ton of training teaching those guys how to do plan reviews at home in a studio session, um, being able to see everyone else's markups, um, which is different from the paper review process because, you know, they, they throw the drawings on a cart and wheel it off to the next department. And now they can actually see if there's a, 
markup from the fire department or the fire group that affects structure and, and back and forth. So yeah. they can readdress those markups when they need to. Nice. Yeah, that's pretty powerful for sure. Yeah. Uh, what's your your favorite uh, feature of, of Bluebeam or your your most used feature personally? My most used? Yeah. Um, boy, I'd say um, I do a lot of area measurements uh, with the different calculations and things like that. Uh -huh. the, me the measurement tools are fantastic. Nice. Yeah. The dynamic fill is a great one. That's always fun to watch. The, you pour the paint in the room or in the area and it fills it out to the walls and gives you the measurements. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, well, let's uh, kind of go shift gears to your blog some. Uh -huh. Why'd you end up starting the Blue Beam and Burgers? <laughs> um, it's really, it's just been a hobby of mine. Um, I've done it on my own and, and ran that for over four years now. Um, I was, when I started Bluebeam myself, I guess seven or so years ago, uh, I was really frustrated with the, what's out there to learn from. There's a lot of videos, a million videos out there showing this is the tool and this is how it works. Um, but there wasn't anybody really showing, here's how you combine this series of tools to achieve something in our industry. Mm -hmm. So I really set out to learn the program to a degree where I can show people how to do those workflows. Uh, so I've designed all of my courses um, to be workflow based. Um, and that's what you're going to see on my blog and my YouTube channel is more of those tips and tricks and how to combine a bunch of tools to accomplish something. Mm -hmm. And yeah, then I the burgers, I just, wherever I'm at traveling, I try to get the best, the weirdest burger I can find. <laughs> hey, that's, that's a good, good mission to be set out on. <laughs> uh, well, what's, what makes a great burger? Well, there's a lot of things, um, you know, what, what they're using for the beef is always interesting. Uh, that's always the best thing. If I always like a burger that you can bite through and you don't really know the, the difference in softness with the bun and the burger itself. Um, but the toppings are where it gets fun. Yeah. Um, pr probably my favorite topping on a burger is um, smoked pulled pork. Mm. Much, much better than bacon. Yeah. <laughs> that's possible. I'd be up for either, but <laughs> <laughs> where's uh, what's the best burger you've ever had? Oh, I always fall back on one from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, the Tap House uh, 41. They uh -huh. have a jambalaya burger that has shrimp and andouille sausage and all the Cajun seasoning. Oh, it's wow. Just, it's amazing. Nice. Yeah. I, I love some good jambalaya. <laughs> yeah. You may it's, have to make a special trip up there. Yeah, it's a good. Kind one. of far for a burger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Well, how do people get a hold of you, Troy? Well, very soon I will be launching my uh, new website, U Chapter 2. It's the letter U and the number 2. So they can check that out. There'll be, uh, if it's not released already by the time this is out, uh, there'll be a forum on there where you can go in and ask your questions and, and hopefully leave some answers as well. Um, and lots of courses on there that we're going to be pushing out. Um, yeah, otherwise, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm very active on there and um, all the social medias. <laughs> awesome. What, what are you most looking forward to this year? This year, just building my company. Um, I, I'm really excited to get out and um, build on the relationships I've made over the years and uh, just kind of broaden the the arena a little bit. You know, work with more people yeah. um, and really just get more experience that way and have have more fun building tools. Awesome. A last question for you. What does innovation mean to you? Ooh, innovation. I would say continuous learning. Uh, just, just keep at it. Always, always be learning something and applying it every day. Never be settling for what you did yesterday. Yeah. I like it. Always be learning. It's a different spin on the always be selling, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Nice. Well, th Troy, thanks so much for, for taking the time. I enjoyed it and best of luck uh, 
in the, the new business. I appreciate that, Todd. Thanks for the, for the time on your platform. I appreciate it.